Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, for most of you, I think it is firmly established that Pastor Scott, meaning me, that I am weird. <laughs> However, I can never get over the fact that other weird people are attracted to me. <laughs> meaning this, that weird people appear in my life out of nowhere. For example, this Thursday afternoon, as I made my way to the car carrying a box of soda for youth group in the Walmart shopping, or the Walmart parking lot, now most of the time I ignore people when I'm in the parking lot and do my own thing, except there was a car that was parked right next to mine. For you see, this car was a vehicle, a sedan, I think, covered with bumper stickers and placards that proclaimed, Jesus saves! Jesus is the only one, in conjunction with various Bible verses. Again, all over the car. But then, here, I'm the weird one. I felt engaged to speak. Why? Now, most normal people, as I said before, would probably have just ignored the fella, the owner of this car, but no, Captain Weirdo <laughs> had to say these words. Interesting car that you have. Curse has why did I do that, as I thought. For with my words, a light switch flicked on with this man. And he said, I call it my praise mobile. Every time when I go here, or there, and everywhere, I am proclaiming my faith and love of Jesus. Jesus is Lord of all. I get lots of questions about my car, which allows me to shout, no, scream from the mountaintops, all about Jesus. So, brother, won't you shout with me? from the mountaintop, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, most normal people would have left the conversation at that time. <laughs> but no, I spoke and I said, I'd be more than happy to proclaim that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And he goes, Amen, as he pounds his car. <laughs> then I said, mountains seem to be lacking here at the Walmart uh, parking lot. Amen! Wait, what? <laughs> Meaning that I can proclaim God as my Lord and Savior anywhere, and that's just on mountains. Amen, brother. And you know, mountains are too far to drive. Amen, brother! Man, you are speaking the truth, but you do know, brother, that I am speaking about mountains metaphorically. I know. Praise God, brother, in the middle of the Walmart parking lot. Praise the Lord. And then he started singing some incoherent song underneath his breath that I couldn't quite make. And that was my chance to go, in the car, in the car, get in the car. But no. <laughs> I had to say to him, brother, praise the Lord. And then he gets up and goes, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, oh. praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and starts dancing in the middle of the Walmart. <laughs> Thankfully, he got into the car. <laughs> now, why do I tell you this story? The reason I tell you this story, I think it reflects how many of us Christians believe our faith should be. Today, as you know, we are celebrating the transfiguration of our Lord. Here he brings up three of his disciples to a mountaintop, and a wondrous sight took place. Is it an ad for Clorox bleach? No. Our Lord Jesus becomes dazzling white, and suddenly Elijah and, Mo and Moses appear, not knowing how many, we know that. Maybe they had a name tag or a t-shirt that said, hey, I'm with Moses here. 
maybe one of them looked like Charlton Heston. <laughs> but something amazing happened on that mountaintop. Our Jesus was different. And then Peter, oh our Peter, wondrously, nervously, and perhaps ignorantly says these words, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. How many times do we want to capture those moments like Peter? How many times do we long for those mountaintop experiences with our faith? How many times do we assume that these experiences is the only way to be for our faith? How many times? Yet the reality of our faith is, and yet the reality of our faith, and furthermore, the emphasis of the story, I mean, I'm talking about the whole gospel, of what happens with Jesus is not about mountains at all. Instead, the heart of the gospel is about the valleys and those in-between plains where God surprises us, transforms us, and loves us so desperately. What do I mean? In our transfiguration story, we often jump to conclusions about this story. Sure, something amazing happened on that mountaintop. Jesus has this metamorphosis, but what role did that serve? We could say that Jesus is the connection and also kind of a contrast with the law and the prophets that Moses and Elijah represent. We could also say that this mountain miracle points to Jesus as the one with whom the prophets foretold. We could also say that this, this moment indicates that the kingdom of God is coming in power. But what if I were to tell you that this transfiguration can be boiled down just to three words. Three little words, but before we get to that, let's look at what happens before the transfiguration. So in our passage it's today, it says six days later, it starts out with that. So I would ask if you would want to look with me in your Bibles that are in front of you, if you brought one with you. Turn to Mark chapter 8, verse 27. The Gospel of Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Chapter 8, verse 27. So right before this verse, Jesus just gets done healing a, a blind man from Bethsaida. And then we go into this. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, well, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. So here, Jesus' identity is firmly established. He's not Elijah. He's not John the Baptist. He is the Messiah. The one that is going to change things in regards to faith. And then it continues in verse 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? 
Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with his holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they will see when the kingdom of God has come with power. So now after the confession of his identity, Jesus tells everyone quite openly what is going to happen. I am going to die on the cross. The Son of Man is going to die on the cross. And then three days later, he will rise again so that you can have life. But it takes some dedication on your part. So for six days now, I'd like for you to stew on this before we go up to the mountain. <coughs> Our Messiah will be crucified and be resurrected. This is stuff that they've never heard before. Two foreign ideas that the disciples had to contemplate, yet it was the very focus of why he came here in the first place. To save us and to reconnect us in a holy relationship with our God. So up to the mountain they go, and they want to stay there. But then verse 7 happens of chapter 9. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud then came a voice, and this is my son, the beloved, and our three little words for today. Listen to him. For our Jesus has the direction for us to follow. Only we have to do one thing. Get off the mountain. We have to get off the mountain and be willing to listen to something new. It is not about us screaming from the mountaintops. When our path is clear, to following him way past the mountain, but to a cross. And to a life of grace that has been given to us as a gift of resurrection bought by his blood. In other words, the transfiguration story is about listening to our Lord and Savior, and I get it that it is so tough. Especially when it comes to the various things within our life that cause us to, well, become deaf to everything and anything or maybe even blind to his presence. So how can we listen? How can we listen to our Lord and Savior? Obviously we can listen to him in prayer, listen to him in scripture, listen to him in the sacraments, but listen to him in surprising ways too, in music, friendship, serving our neighbor, building your church, laughing with others. Listen to our Savior, your Savior. <laughs> Get off the mountain and start following Jesus in the highs and the lows and in every place in between and start really living. But it begins with you listening. Listen today. <laughs>